All right, welcome to lesson number 30 in year three of the science, high school science class. And today's class is on seedless plants. Okay, and um, we are going to start. First of all, I would like to ask you a question. How are things going with your garden project? How are things going with the garden project? So, Sydney says, I did the most project that we talked about last time. If you want me to tell you about that at the end, that would be awesome. Yes. Patrick says, I have sprouts. Great. I've managed to keep the cat away. Good, good accomplishment, Patrick. Mm -hmm. Emmeline says, I, don't, I haven't done it yet. We need to get all the plants site. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. So now remember it's, it's probably getting to the time when you are going to have to execute the, your plan. Anna says I'm still waiting for it to warm up. So there is probably about this time it may be uh, good to start some of the indoor planting, the seedlings, okay, before you transfer them outside. Samuel says I have an onion that is three feet tall. That is great. And Patrick says, I will be moving them outside soon. Uh, will that work for the photography? Yes. Uh -huh. So you can take pictures of, of your seedlings growing inside and then what happens when they start growing outside. Mm -hmm. Sydney says we had seeds, but we found out that they were too old to plant, and so we had to get some new ones. But we haven't planted them yet because we have a lot of going on for us right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is true. You know, many times we need to make sure that the seeds that we have for planting are uh, good seeds, okay, like Alma 32 teaches us that we need to plant the good seeds. Or if we plant a seed and does not germinate, then we know that the seed is bad. That that is not a, a good seed, okay. So let me start the webcam also here, all right. And although it doesn't show very well, that's it. Okay. So um, let's uh, get uh, started with uh, the class, okay, yeah, the contrast is really not very good um, on this, I think it's because of the light, okay, so I'm going to stop the, 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 the webcam if you don't mind, okay, yeah, it's to have a, a very bright window over there, okay. <clears throat> So, uh, Emeline, would you like to take us with uh, to the, um, oh, hold on, before we start that, I wanted to share this uh, little bit of the attention activity. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me try this. So, in this uh, graphic that we are seeing shows us how carbon is uh, being cycle. Okay, so this is the, the, the carbon cycle graph, all right? So we see that the carbon that is in the planet, it actually is in, goes into, into cycles, all right? And the legend here, it says, it shows, this diagram of the fast carbon cycle shows the movement of carbon between land, atmosphere, and oceans in billions of tons per year. Yellow numbers are natural fluxes, red are human contributions, white indicate store carbon. Okay, so the, the white numbers are store carbon, the yellow numbers are natural uh, fluxes, and then the, ye the red numbers are the human activity uh, as it is uh, uh, done, okay? So 
Um, first of all, I have a question for you. Why do you think that this is called the fast carbon cycle? What would be the slow carbon cycle? What would be the slow carbon cycle and why is this the fast carbon cycle? You can answer on the chat, okay, on the question board, or you can unmute yourself and answer on the microphone. Mm -hmm. Patrick says, carbon from the earth consolidating. That is correct. That is one way to say it, but it's, it's true. So the slow carbon cycle would be the geological carbon cycle, the cycle that happens with carbon as it, it gets a cycle in the, on the earth, inside the earth's crust. Okay, so the volcanoes and, you know, the, the earthquake activity, uh, fires and so on, all those things basically are what they, what we would call the slow carbon cycle because that is, you know, in millions of years. This one is the fast one because this one we are seeing how much carbon is exchanged, okay, per year billions of tons per year, okay. Where do you see the highest uh, deposits of carbon here in this graph? Where do you see the highest concentrations or deposits of carbon in this graph? Anna says the fossil pool and the oceans that's right. So if you see 10,000 billion tons per year, okay, and then 37,000 billion tons per year, okay. So it is interesting when you compare that, all right, and then the carbon sinks, okay, the carbon sinking, you know, basically the carbon being absorbed through photosynthesis, the plant biomass, the carbon soil, the soil carbon being absorbed and so on. They are really large uh, amounts, okay. Even when you just consider the human activity, all right, you have that the human activity, the net, is just 4 billion tons, okay? You would say, wow, that is a lot, all right? But when you actually consider the, the large amounts of what, the, what the, the, the planet can do, that is really not a whole lot at all, okay? So we have that uh, through the burning of fossil fuel, cement, and last use change, they estimate that we contribute, okay, 9 billion tons, but we also, through forestation and through other things, we contribute the absorption of 5 billion tons. So the net change increase is 4 billion tons. It's really not a whole lot. So that is, this is one of the reasons why I am not a very big um, believer or promoter of global warming myself, okay? So, uh, Emily, would you like to take us now to uh, the first uh, academic concept, please? Mm -hmm. I would love to. So for academic concept number one, it is seedless vascular plants and all non-vascular plants reproduce by making spores. Um, so we've learned about different types of plants, which is non-vascular and vascular. And specifically for this concept, we're going to talk about seedless vascular plants. So um, in the last lesson, we focused on mosses and hornworts and liverworts, non-vascular plants that produce spores. Um, but at the same time, spores are not limited to just non-vascular plants, but also to vascular plants. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, and spores do the same thing as seeds, um, only with a few differences. So for an example, 
Um, both are used for reproductive purposes. Um, spores do not form deep inside the plant like a seed does. And also, spores also need nutrition from its surroundings, so it doesn't really have a ready supply like a seed does. Um, a good example um, of a vascular plant with spores is ferns. And I'm pretty sure we're, we have a good idea of what ferns are. Um, but ferns, on the underside um, of the fronds, they have spores, and they're very tiny. Um, and like a plant, they need to have the right conditions to grow. And so there's two videos that talks a lot about um, the fern life cycle. Um, the first one um, gives a very detailed overview, and the second one is kind of like a brief summary. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about the first one. And so um, the video starts out with the dominant phase of ferns, which is the spore fight stage. And we've learned that, you, that when you turn the fronds over, you can see the sori. And the sori is plural for sorus, um, which has a sort of cluster for sporangia. Um, and you can kind of see that on the video, how they have the sorus. And then deep inside, you have, I believe that's the sporangia. Mm -hmm. So some sori is unprotected, and other sori is covered by a cap called inducium. Um, and inside the sorus, there is sporangium. And the sporangium has an outer jacket. And when it matures, a thin, delicate annulus forms. Um, and on the opposite side of the annulus, a lip cells form. So that's the sporangium. And then you have that sort of area that's the annulus. And it kind of puffs out as it starts to mature. And then it'll come around to the other side where you'll see um, the lip cells. And that's kind of, kind of reminds me of like a pocket. So that's kind of like a lip cell. And so below the jacket, there are two layers of cells called tapetum. And they have fertile tissue um, inside of it, which has sporocyte cells. And each sporocyte cell is a diploid, which means it has two sets of chromosomes, one from each parent. And this part matures, and then the nucleus begins to divide by meiosis. Mm -hmm. and, and so after, after it divides by meiosis, what is the result of these cells? Um, after it forms from meiosis, it forms into a tetrad, correct? Mm -hmm. You have yeah. water cells, and then I think, doesn't it like part to like form like around the daughter cells? Mm -hmm. And the tetrad now is composed of haploid cells. Yes. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, so the cytoplasm comes to tetrad, and then the tapetum breaks down and it forms a protective sporopollen. And so now we have what is known as spores. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of see how it spreads apart. Yeah. Um, so if we, go, if we go here to this, um, other, the other video, where are we in this uh, cycle? So we would be in the sporangium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, or so at least, like, around the middle, this like, area. Biosis, like about to go to spore dispersal. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, and then um, what happens when it comes time for the spore release is that when the sporangia is ready to open, what happens is the annulus begins to dry. So you can see in the start of the video how it kind of looked green, and now it's kind of amber color orange. And so as the annulus dries, the water evaporates. And what happens is the tension between the wall and the water molecules that are evaporating um, begin to grow, begin to increase. And as it increases, the outer walls go inward. So you can kind of see how they're getting pushed down. And the annulus begins to contract like an accordion. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was kind of cool to see how that animation worked and how it just went up and down, up and down. And eventually, um, after it's being pushed down, um, the annulus tears the lip cells and the spore case begins to open and it kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And because of the loss of water, the annulus can't be held together. And the pull is released, and the spores shoot out, and it's so fast before it closes. So there's no chance for the annulus to collapse over the spores again. <laughs> you can kind of see how they just shoot out. Um, and that... Now, that, that is an amazing natural catapult. Yes. Isn't that amazing, really, how nature, you know, does that, okay? You know, it's, it's an amazing design of God, frankly, when you Definitely. think about it. <laughs> I had to watch it a few times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what is happening now is that when the spores germinate, um, they form a bisexual hermaphroditic individual. And that basically means that the plant has female and male parts. And so the rhizoid attaches the spore to the soil, and then the sheet of cells, which is kind of forming, um, begins to follow, and that forms the gametophyte or pathalus. And then you have the dot um, meristem, mm -hmm. where the female part of the plant is. And then you have this part, which is talking about the rhizoids. And next to the rhizoids, is where the male part um, of the plant is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the rhizoids, rhizoids kind of act like very rudimentary roots. Yeah. They tell that the, the protalus together. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now again, let me let me emphasize: in what part of the cycle are we now? So we uh, right now we're at probably um, the young gametophyte. So uh -huh. it's not exactly at mature where they start releasing spores. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like before that stage. That's right. So we are still over here. Now, it is interesting. Again, I find this fascinating that this, all this is with haploid cells. So yes. if you think about it, if you look at a fern, at the mature fern, and let's say that the fern has, I don't know, let's say that it has 32 chromosomes in each cell, okay? The gametophyte, each cell in the gametophyte only has 16 chromosomes, only half of them, okay? So, um, you know, humans, we have... Uh, 26 chromosomes. All our cells have 26 chromosomes except the sperm cells and the egg cells, but they do not form a separate organism made out of 13 chromosomes each. That doesn't exist for, for animals, okay? But in plants, this happens, that you have an actual organism that is living and dividing and, and doing things that is just all haploid cells. Okay. Just think about it. I don't know if that rings any bells to you, but... <laughs> oh, it's cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because, you know, in animals, we don't have that at all. Yeah. Okay. But in plants, that is, that is actually a part of... Uh, especially of these uh, sporophytes, all the plants that reproduce with the spores, that part, this part, the, the haploid part of the cycle, is actually an important part of the cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Let's keep going. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so at, it's okay. It's the antheridia, and it has an outer wall called a ring cell and a capsule which surrounds fertile tissue. Mm -hmm. And close to the notch, kind of like what I've mentioned before, is the archegonia. And it's kind of like what it is in mosses, where it has a neck and a venter. And inside that venter is the egg cell. So you can see the neck. And then you have the capsule. I believe that's right. No, it's this, no the venter. Mm -hmm. And then inside the venter is the egg cell. Mm -hmm. And what, another thing that I found interesting about the friend cycle was that both the female and male parts can be formed at the same time 
or at different times, and it all depends on self or crossed fertilization. Um, so one of the things that it mentions is that water plays an important part in the fertilization of what we know as ferns. And what happens is if a bisexual plant is in the female stage, um, in water, the female part releases a hormone called anthuridid. How do you pronounce it? Anthuridogen. Uh huh. And that stimulates growth for other gametophyte, which will only produce um, male, the male part. So only it would only produce anthuridium. Mm -hmm. So here we, have, here we have a picture of the, the gametophytes. Okay, these are really small compared to ferns, and usually we don't see them. At least I don't remember really ever um, seeing the, the, the gametophyte of ferns. Okay, I am very familiar with ferns, with look, watching ferns and seeing ferns, but I haven't actually noticed the gametophytes. They are very small, and you know, again, yeah. they are right at the ground level. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what's happening? I was going to say, uh, what's happening now um, is a process of fertilization, and so, like I mentioned before, water stimulates um, the fertilization process, and so the capsule of the anthuridia begins to open and releases sperm cells. And that's a sperm cell right there. It's kind of spir um, spiral shaped and has flagella, a bunch of flagella. And that is the female part of the cell, and that is releasing a sperm attractant. And eventually, um, the sperm cell will travel um, into the female part, down the neck, and to the venture, the chamber where the egg is. And then you can kind of see the sperm cells squeezing through. And then the egg nuclei and the sperm nuclei will fuse, and that causes fertilization. And in return, it creates a zygote. Mm -hmm. And then let's, the next part... Let's see, um, now where we are in the cycle here. Mm -hmm. We are in the new sporophyte stage. So you have kind of like well, you have the zygote, and then what we're going into is the new sporophyte, and then the gametophyte on the bottom. That's right. And so okay. now, remember now the zygote, when the, the egg is fertilized by the sperm, now it becomes a diploid cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's keep watching, and you, you keep going, Emily. Sorry, I feel kind of bad. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. We, we are a good team. We are a good team here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's happening now is that the zygote starts to divide um, in the archegonia. So it doesn't go anywhere, it just kind of stays there. And what happens is um, it doesn't have any roots. So what it does is the foot or the upper part of the embryo um, absorbs nutrients and can kind of see it grow, and then all of these little tiny orange balls represent the nutrients. Mm -hmm. And as it grows, the venture begins to stretch, and then it ruptures. So it eventually will kind of split. Mm -hmm. And then on one side, it releases the root, which is what we know to be roots, which is used to absorb water and nutrients in the soil and kind of secure it. And the other part, um, of the venture begins to form the first leaf and the future stem, which is the rhizome. And the leaf will grow through the notch to reach the sunlight. Kind of see it curling upwards. And the rhizome will um, emerge shortly after that, that little line trailing, which will provide more leaves and roots. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, then the whole process basically starts all over. So you have the sporophyte. The sporophyte again. Okay. Now, you know, it is very interesting to me. Again, first, let's uh, see if I can uh, see this, this part. Okay, well, there. 
the size of the gametophyte. So here we have a, you know, the nail and a, a finger pointing to the gametophyte, really, really small, really small. And it is important in order for the gametophyte to be fertilized that there is a lot of water, okay? So the, the sperm can actually swim towards the female part and fertilize the egg. So very, very small. Another thing that I don't know if, if you could uh, fully appreciate this, but in this part of the animation, what you are seeing is the gametophyte, so the green part here growing, these are all still haploid cells. And then these other cells, the cells that compose the rhizome and the new leaf of the sporophyte, these are diploid cells. So we have one organism, the same organism, that is kind of, you know, if you wish, really connected together is the same organism, but is composed of haploid cells and diploid cells. Okay. I find that yeah. very interesting. <laughs> okay. And so here we are again in all this, uh, the, this part of the cycle, the diploid part of the, of the cycle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. How, how this, does this compare to the moss life cycle, Emeline? Any, any ideas of what you remember from the moss life cycle? Um, yes. So, um, one, well, a few things is that, um, kind of what you mentioned before, was that they both depend on water. Mm -hmm. So, in order for the spores to travel in, or not spores, sperms to travel, um, in a moss plant to get to the female part, at the same time, um, they also, the ferns also need water to get their sperms um, to the female part. So that part was kind of cool. And then they both have um, archegonia, which is the mm -hmm. female part, and antheridium, the male part. They both use spores. Um, and then the two differences that I could tell from the video was that, again, moss is non-vascular and ferns are vascular, and then the dominant stage that we know of for moss is the neophyte, and then for the ferns it is sporophyte, which is why we never really see it in the gametophyte stage when it's so tiny. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so it is interesting because most of the time when you see a moss, you are actually seeing the moss in the haploid state, the gametophyte state, most of the times when you see a fern, you're actually seeing the fern in the diploid state, in the sporophyte state. Okay, so it reverses that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mosses spend most of their life in the haploid state, where ferns spend most of the, their life in the diploid state. Mm -hmm. I hope this makes sense to, to everyone. That's to me. <laughs> okay. And they are both, like it says there, both of them are seedless. Okay. Emily, anything else? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. At the end of the lesson, they talk a bit more about three sorts of vascular plants that produce spores, and those are quillworts, club moss, and horsetail. And quillworts um, are in the diet of many animals, and they typically grow in wet marshy conditions and look like grass, but are but really are stiff. Personally. I don't think of grass in the look of it. I actually think of green onions. I know that sounds kind of weird, but mm -hmm. that's kind of what my mind sees. And then next beside it is the horsetail, and A is, I believe, when it is about to send off the spores, 
and then B is kind of the vegetative, oh, sorry, I always get this messed up. So yeah, A no, no is and then B is the reproduction. I don't know why I always get that messed up. Mm -hmm. And right. the unique thing about horse tails is that they're very ancient. Not that it was cool that they could reach up to four feet, um, but at the highest 15. And another thing that I thought, in I thought interesting was also the spores because they can remain airborne and they have elators um, which can be extended until it sees the rain. And then when the elators get wet, um, it rolls tightly around the spore causing it to fall and eventually and hopefully it will land in an area that is wet. So I thought that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very and, interesting that, that yeah. the spores are really, really small and they remain airborne, okay? You know, a lot of people many times get a allergic, allergic reactions to, to pollen, okay? Sometimes these spores can also may give you allergic reactions. Mm -hmm. okay. And then another thing that horsetail does, which I thought was also kind of interesting, was mm -hmm. that when horses eat them or when any animal in general eats them in large quantities. They also get sick because it ruins their vitamin B. <laughs> that was kind of cool as well. Yes, and it seems that for some reason they become addicted to eating the horse tail. So it, it, it seems that it, it, it is really, um, they like it, okay, but it actually would end up killing them. So really, not good for horses. Uh, someone here in the chat uh, asks, it says, I'm a little confused. What is the difference between haploid and diploid? Okay. Could someone help me out on that? What's the difference between haploid and diploid? Mm -hmm. uh, Emeline, do you think you can... Yes, I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what a haploid is, um, a haploid is basically, um, so like a cellular nucleus, has only a single set of unpaired chromosomes, and then the diploid has two complete sets, and it has one from each parent. So a haploid's kind of like one, and then diploid's two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... I'm going here to the um, the article on PLODI, okay, so PLODI is the number of sets of chromosomes in a cell, okay, and it says usually a gamete, a sperm or an egg, carries a full set of chromosomes that includes a single copy of each chromosome, all right. So when you have just a single copy of each chromosome, that is a haploid cell, okay? A haploid cell. So a haploid number is the number of chromosomes in a gamete, in a sperm or the egg. But we have seen also that all the cells in the spore, in the gametophyte, in the mature gametophyte, all of these cells are haploid. They are all having just one single set of chromosomes. When the zygote is pro produced, the sperm and the egg fuse together, each one bringing their own set of chromosomes, then you have a diploid a cell that has two copies of each chromosome, two copies of each chromosome. So each parent, the mother and the father, basically, the sperm and the egg, contribute half of the chromosomes to the diploid cells. Once the diploid cell is there, then the zygote, okay, starts a dividing, all right? And so it explains here, oh, I was wrong at the, at the beginning, I did the, 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 the wrong example. So it says, for humans, that is a diploid species, so most of our cells, all of our cells are a diploid, 
N equals 23. Okay, so the sperm cell and the egg cell has 23 chromosomes. All the other cells contain 46, two complete haploid sets, which make up 23 homologous, okay, or similar chromosome pairs. All right? So that is how, how it goes for humans. So all of our cells, the cells in our skin, the cells in our bones, the blood cells, all the cells have 46 chromosomes, except the sperm cells and the egg cells that have only 23. They are haploid. Okay. In the ferns and the mosses, you have that all the cells in this part of the cycle are haploid, and then all the cells in this part of the cycle are diploid. All right. The spores are haploid, and the zygote is diploid. And the same thing happens with the, the mosses, when you have the moss life cycle, that all the cells in the mosses are haploid, okay, in most of the times, except when they are fertilized, and then you have diploid cells over in that part of the cycle. Does that help? I hope that it wasn't it was more helpful than, than confusing. Okay. That phenomena, okay, it says, I think it helps a little bit. All right, excellent. Well, I, I, I hope so. So that phenomena about, you know, this um, um, thing about, you know, having haploid organisms or diploid organisms is called alternation of generations. Let's see this part. It says, all plants and many fungi and algae switch between a haploid and a diploid state. Okay? With one of the stages emphasized over the other. So like we saw here, for the mosses, the haploid state is emphasized, is longer. The diploid state is shorter. In the ferns is the other way around. The haploid state is shorter and the diploid state is longer. But it still is a, it's a large state. All right? And it says this is called alteration of generations. Okay? Most fungi and algae are haploid during the principal stage of their life cycle, as are plants like mosses. Most animals are diploid, but male bees, wasps, and ants are haploid organisms because they develop from unfertilized haploid eggs. I didn't know that. Wow, that is interesting. So, the male bees and wasps and ants, okay, that are actually the majority of them are haploid organisms. I didn't know that. So they all the worker bees. Mm -hmm. So here we have the article. You can look and look and study this uh, a little bit more. All right, but I find it fascinating that. Because most of the times I have always thought about, you know, our cells, like in the human case, that most of our cells are diploid. They have the 46 chromosomes, okay? But in plants and in some uh, insects, it seems that that is not the, always the case. Very, very interesting. This actually, all these kind of shows me that, you know, God had had to create all these things. This is so such a complex system, okay? There are so many, you know, intricate parts, like we were seeing even just the, the catapult created in order to release the spores, okay? Uh, that was, you know, amazing 
the engineering that goes into into doing that to to release spores far away okay that cannot happen without someone designing it okay and making it really work i i i find that to be a testimony of the hand of god how god actually designs all these these things beautiful really beautiful mm -hmm. all right okay so uh, in this other academic concept let's see patrick would you like to teach us this part sure excellent um all righty uh it started yeah uh, so it's basically just talking about how um these plants these ferns have been around for a really long time and um eventually they get put so deep down into the earth that they make these fossils and um i've actually found a couple of them i i used to have them i don't know where they went mm -hmm. but it's really cool because you can like see the plant indentation or rather the plant popping out of the rock yeah something like that mm -hmm. um some of them there's like the uh fern fossil that's on one of the first ones here i don't know which one it is but um it's really cool and um oh let's scroll down here so um the, since these ferns have been on the earth for such a long time and they become fossilized it, it sort of ties back into what we were talking about earlier with the um, with carbon in the introduction or mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't know what to call it but when these plant yeah that when the plants are there on top and they go down into the soil carbon and eventually they get so far down that it just becomes compressed into rock the sedimentary rock which is just a bunch of you know um, dirt and sand particles compressed into a solid um, and that sort of forms the fossil but that also can form a um, special piece of rock called coal coal is a very just carbon it's basically just a bunch of carbon not quite as thick as diamonds but if you take enough coal you can actually compress it into diamonds it's really cool mm -hmm. I made that. Mm -hmm. but um if you take this coal, it people use it for energy sources. That's where you know coal engines for train came from and stuff like that. And they use it because it burns for a rather long time, longer than wood. And um, this coal that people have is mined from very deep in the ground. And this video is just showing how much coal this is. It gets pretty deep. I've got to say. Yeah, or for Christmas too, if you're being naughty. And it just it just comes up and just destroys this wall. Those mangled gears over there. And they actually have to salt the mines with uh, a special covering. Otherwise, uh, the miners will get black lung, which is horrible disease. Mm -hmm. And you can just see it turning and destroying the wall. And I think mm -hmm. the point they're trying to make with this um, coal mining video was to show how much plant mass had to go down underneath the earth and then be compressed into carbon to form this much coal, because that is a lot of coal. <laughs> a lot of coal. <laughs> I don't think there's any other way to put it. <laughs> a lot of coal. Yeah. Then, uh -huh. That coal is processed and then ships out to places that use it for energy or for Christmas. <laughs> for Christmas. <laughs> and um, let me let me yeah. switch to this part there. The wall, long wall mining. Holy cow. Look at all that coal. Got a lot of naughty kids this year. <laughs> Well, and, and it's, it's really, like you said, uh, it is interesting to think about the amount of plants 
that have had to be fossilized in order to produce all this coal. Yeah, it's true. Like in the lesson plan, it says that millions of years ago, they're from in large sections of ground in Pennsylvania and West Virginia were mm -hmm. covered by millions of ferns, and they were buried and pressed into coal. That's why that place is rich in coal mining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very interesting. Okay. And um, Emmeline says here in, in, the, in the questions is, we have a family up in Ohio, and every time we travel up there, I believe it's in West Virginia, we see this town that has this coal mine. I remember seeing a huge pile of black stuff on the ground and massive machines. Okay, so there's lots of, of mines and areas. Fortunately, here in the United States, we have been blessed with a lot of coal mines. Okay. Um, that has helped us to become energy rich. Okay. I guess I don't try the promised land for nothing. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. No. It is. It is a great, great blessing, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. it says here that besides making coal, um, fossil ferns and other fossilized plants trapped in the Earth's crust gives us clues about what the Earth was like millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a couple of examples here. Um, one, one example that I thought of before I even read those was in Jurassic Park. How, you know how the, um, the mosquitoes were trapped in amber? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then they were used, that blood they took the dinosaurs was used to make other dinosaurs. That, that's sort of what I thought about. It's sort of just like a DNA to the past sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. The fossils... You know, the, the, the cool thing about the amber is that the amber preserve the insects pretty much intact, okay? And so in, in the, the, the Jurassic Park movie, they actually were able to get the DNA from the dinosaurs out of the blood that the insect might have sucked, okay? So I don't know how they, you know, they basically had to do a lot of trial and error, okay, um, because this insect may have sucked blood of any type of organism, but they were lucky and got these dinosaurs that way, okay. I wouldn't say they were lucky, you know, with what happened later in the series. No, 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 that's true, that's true. <laughs> exactly, yes. Uh -huh. So, in the case of fossils, what happens is that even though the, um, you know, some of the fossils kind of remain, the, uh, keep the imprint of the original organism, the organic matter is either uh, transformed into coal, okay, or it is actually replaced by sedimentary matter and, and, and silica, okay, and so then you have the imprint of the, the things, all right. Like, uh, let, me be, uh, let me see if I find it again, not this one, this one here, okay, this picture where you see the imprint of the leaf is not the leaf itself, so we couldn't really recover the DNA of the leaf, but this is the leaf having been replaced by other minerals, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It, um, it reminds me of, uh, you know how you're sometimes in movies like placed in West Africa, you see these huge gigantic leaves just... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Samuel says that yeah, in Jurassic Park they created these uh, clones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does the lesson tell us about here, about Pangea? Do you know what that is? Do you yes, remember? It mm -hmm. was a, um, a supercontinent. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually expected to have one in the next couple of million years. Basically, what a supercontinent is is just where all of the um, uh, all of the continents that we have that we had, or I guess still have, they haven't all gone. We're mm -hmm. all pushed together into this one huge mass of land, completely surrounded by water. Um, I suspect that it probably took up at least one hemisphere, mm -hmm. and this this huge mass of land 
was basically just where all of this other stuff was, like North America and South America, that stayed together, but Africa, Antarctica, and India, and Australia was all together, and then one day it just, it split, I suspect, because the tectonic plank plates were moving. Absolutely, and, yes. Mm -hmm. And it split into what we have now. Mm -hmm. Little by little, it has started, you know, splitting on the continents, drifting apart, okay. In the lesson, it mentioned something about this area. What, do you remember what they mentioned? Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was that where, um, uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh-huh. Was that where the, like, I, I don't know. It looks like a tectonic plate, like, line. Uh -huh. uh, so it says here this, uh, for example, these fossils of leaves from the Glossus Petris plant have been found in coastal parts of India and Australia. This okay. is a clue that at one time these two lands might have been connected. So in order to make this map of Pangaea, okay, you could probably look at what are the fossils remains of the different parts and then put the puzzle back together. All right. I've never been good at puzzles. <laughs> so imagine one. Yeah, so imagine if you find fossils that are similar between this area of India now and this part of Australia now, even though they are separate. You could see, oh, okay, those eventually, you know, most likely they were together at some time. And the same thing with the fossils between Africa and South America or Africa and Antarctica. By the way, Antarctica has a lot of fossils that indicate that at some time there was a much warmer weather. Okay. So... You know, that kind of shows to, to support some of this theory of the Pangaea continent. Okay. I guess that's how um, some of the species we have in North America, um, before they died off, could have could be traced back to Africa and stuff like that. That's right, yes. Uh -huh. That is one of the reasons why they believe, for example, that we had a mammoth, woolly mammoth elephants here in North America, and they have found a lot of fossils of that. Okay, that is kind of together, you know, common with uh, Eurasia and common with, with Africa. Mm -hmm. So, excellent. Okay, anything else, hey, Patrick? Uh, I don't think so. I'm going to hand it over to the Gospel Principal now. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Ryan, would you like to take us there to the Gospel Principal? Sure. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Ryan? Okay, so the gospel principle is if ancient buried records helps us to understand the truth of gospel and teach us about the history of the earth. So one of the biggest um, books that we know of as members of the church that was buried is the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, if uh, the interesting thing about the Book of Mormon is uh, if um, we didn't have it, we probably wouldn't know uh, like where the Native Americans came from. Mm -hmm. Because um, uh, Nephi uh, was able to find the Americas, and uh, this is where the Book of Mormon was found. So it's really interesting. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, imagine, um, imagine, you know, people that don't know about the Book of Mormon, they mm -hmm. really have, um, you know, they have basically theories of where the Native Americans come from, but there's really not much evidence. Through the Book of Mormon, we know about the Jaredites, Okay, and how important of a civilization they were. Okay, and we know about the Nephites and the Lamanites, and we know about how 
what you know what the lemonites uh, became okay yeah so we can connect all that all the the, the the history of civilization in in the Americas through the account of the Book of Mormon mm -hmm. yeah and it's really interesting how uh, you're um, able to connect uh, all that history and it all just falls in place exactly yes so. mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, and then, uh, let's see. It, um, uh, one thing that's uh, really interesting about the Book of Mormon is just how it was uh, made out of gold. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how that means it's just kind of a symbol that um, of how precious they are. Um, well, but, but there is also a very, very, very practical reason for Mormon and Moroni and Nephi, okay, to make the plates of the Book of Mormon out of gold. What was the practical reason? Uh, to um, just because of the. Uh, metal and if it was like made out of paper probably would have been ruined so that's right yeah mm -hmm. so in the book of mormon itself we we know that the nephites and the lemonites kept other records but none of those survive none of those survive okay uh, and in part of the book of mormon it actually says we know that what we don't write in plates it will be destroyed by just time, okay? So, yeah. you know, so it was actually a very practical thing for the plates to be of gold. What else, what was the difference between, for example, the brass plates and the gold plates? Um, Do we have the uh, brass plates? No, we don't. Or, uh, we do. We have some of it, but not all of it. Well, what do you mean we have some of the brass plates? Well, so, it isn't some of it in the Bible, but not all of it. That's right, yeah. So we have a copy, okay, okay, but the brass plates, because they were made of brass, they didn't survive. So not even, not even brass was uh, good enough to survive all the centuries and the humidity and everything. Brass also rusts and decays, okay? Gold doesn't rust. And yeah. so whatever you have of gold is going to remain the same all the time, all right? So that was why it was, it was made of, of that, okay? Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. What other example of, of ancient records that were preserved do we learn uh, about in the lesson? Well, there is this um, uh, one, uh, there, there are some records that it talks about is uh, in 1947, there was a young shepherd uh, mm -hmm. one of his sheep ran off, or a goat ran off, sorry, not a sheep, um, to go, uh, so the, ran off, and so the boy went to go, go try to find him, but uh, he ended up going the wrong way into this, or uh, went into this cave, and um, where the goat went in, and uh, it says he, uh, he threw a rock into the cave to try to scare it out, he heard something that would break. He went into the cave and, um, and saw a pot that was broken. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it says it was rolled up into some parchment. He discovered over 900 different types of records uh, written on parchment. Uh, Perius? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of copper. Uh, and said is that uh, parchment is a um, is an animal skin 
uh, that is used to write on. So it's, I, I believe it's kind of like um, leather, but mm -hmm. not exactly. So. It is, it is actually um, leather, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, so um, it says the scrolls uh, contain copies and parts of the Bible and uh, in written Hebrew, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And um, yeah, so it's really interesting how um, we have so many records that have survived mm -hmm. from uh, the way they were stored and um, what types of um, material they were made of. So. Yeah. So why do you think that these uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were able to survive? Um, I think uh, a lot of it is because of just having the Father protecting uh, mm -hmm. the scrolls. Um, and for, because it seems like it, from this type of uh, material, it, it seems like that would just be destroyed. But I think Heavenly Father had a lot to do with it. So. Yeah. Also, big part of, you know, part of that protection that you mentioned that Heavenly Father provided were that the records, the scrolls, were kept inside jars, okay, like you see here. And the jars were put in a very, very dry place. So this area, okay, has almost no rain. And so with no rain, there's very little possibility for fungi and bacteria to grow. And so the, the, the scrolls that are made out of skin, out of, uh, you know, uh, goat or, or deer skin, they survived because they there wasn't anything to decompose them, okay, to make them decay. So it was really a, a great thing that the people that wrote these records put them, put them in these jars and then they put them in very, very dry places, okay, where they could be preserved. Mm -hmm. When you compare that, you know, these caves, and compare that to where, where were the golden plates buried? Where did Joseph uh, Smith find the golden plates? Underneath a rock. Uh, uh -huh. in, in, in which area? Uh, in New York, right? Yeah, in New York. Is New York a dry place, like here? Uh, oh, sort of, yeah. Uh, no, not at all. It's very, very wet comparatively. <laughs> Sydney says nope. <laughs> so you probably have, have been over there. Very, very wet, Sydney says yes. So imagine if the, if the Nephites would have written their, their records in skins, they would not have survived because, you know, the area where Nephi and, and Mormon and Moroni were, it was very wet. So they had to put it in gold plates so they would be preserved. Okay, gold would be the only thing that would survive all that humidity. Instead here in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have that the records are preserved precisely because they were in extremely dry place. Okay, so very, very interesting, yeah. So how do, what, it, what can you do as a comparison between uh, these scrolls, okay, and the, the gold plates, and the fossils that we were talking about of plants? Um, well, they're both very old and um, mm -hmm. they've... Uh, uh, are, um, let's see, I'm just trying to think of the right words. Um, uh, Sydney says they were both buried, so yeah. That, yeah, they were both buried, uh-huh. They were um, both preserved. Mm -hmm. And that they were all both uh, kept uh, the same. Uh-huh, they were both kept, uh-huh, excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
it's not it. Can't think of a whole lot else. Uh -huh. so. Emeline says they were both found or hid through inspiration. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And Sydney says they are both studied very deeply to understand their full meaning. That's right. Even even plants, fossil plants, and, uh, and animals and so on, they are studied in order so we can understand what they can tell us from the past. Okay. So these are very, very important records, both the fossils and the the plates, the Bible, the Book of Mormon that help us to understand the past. Okay. Good deal. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you would like to, to add, Ryan? Um, I think that's it. Okay, excellent. Thank you very, very much. Very good lesson. Okay. So, um, Sydney, he says, do you still want me to show you the moss? Yes, let's say prayer, okay, and then we'll have you show us, uh, show us that. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So, Sydney, go ahead with prayer. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for today. We're grateful for all the very many blessings you've given us. As Papa says, we go throughout the rest of our day today that we'll be able to do what we need to do and that and if we have anything that we need to get done, that we will get it done correctly. We're thankful for the lesson that we were able to learn today. We say these things in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very, very much, Sydney. Okay. So now let me okay. 